director of cardiovascular fellowship training program, uh, which uh, Steve uh, Wagner had uh, managed uh, for 20 years. So it was truly wonderful to have uh, Glenn with his uh, background. So his previous appointments had been at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University as an assistant professor of medicine. He was also the associate program director of Department of Medicine there, and also he was the medical director of cardiac rehab at Johns Hopkins. Uh, Glenn has a very illustrious uh, educational and training background. He did his uh, bachelor's from University of Michigan at Ann Arbor and then went on to Loyola, Chicago for his uh, MD. And then came back to Ann Arbor, did his uh, residency in internal medicine, and then uh, went to Johns Hopkins University where he finished his cardiovascular fellowship in 2004 and also did a master's in health sciences at Johns Hopkins. Uh, in his short span of six, seven years, he has uh, done a lot of uh, scholarly activities. And I think it's, uh, uh, looking at his uh, resume, it's uh, uh, really uh, amazing and, and uh, enlightening that for young uh, faculty as well as uh, fellows, that there are so many opportunities that we can get involved in scholarly activities that uh, sets an academician uh, apart from, uh, from uh, a non-academic physician. He has 13 original articles, he has 25 abstracts, yet uh, he was involved in approximately $3 million extramural grants in his areas of research that involves cardiac MRI, non visive imaging, and echocardiography. Uh, he has uh, been a uh, member of the peer-reviewed uh, committees, uh, review articles, editorials, case reports, book chapters, letters, other media, including films, DVDs, videos, and he has been part of all that. Uh, he was also uh, involved in cardiosmart.org, which is an ACC, American College of Cardiology, online foundation uh, uh, source, resource for a blood pressure tracker, where he was a co-creator and editor of that uh, online site. And if you see the uh, self-assessment uh, XAP, like MKSAP, for uh, Glenn has been uh, in the question writing committee, contributor of uh, these uh, different products. Uh, that we use for certification and, and recertification. So you'll see his name and all these XF. Uh, uh, and then not only uh, in uh, Baltimore, he directed and implanted a board type multiple choice uh, in training exam for cardiovascular fellows in Port of Spain in Trinidad and West Indies. That was a collaborative uh, uh, academic venture with Johns Hopkins. Uh, his passion, I think, looking at his CV is more in his teaching and his leadership uh, role in different uh, areas in classroom, clinical, CME, workshops. He's had numerous of those uh, educational activities that uh, he has uh, done. Uh, in his clinical uh, areas, he's an expert in uh, level three in echocardiography, in uh, cardiac uh, MR, as well as in cardiac CT. Uh, in his honors and recognition awards, he was a graduate at cum laude at Loyola University. He was a bronze beeper award in recognition of medical student teaching. He was a finalist for a young clinician award in EHA. He had a national research service award from Johns Hopkins early career travel award. He was a first place junior faculty clinical research at Northwestern. He is recognized by ACC as an emerging faculty and he is invited to an invitation-only faculty educator workshop on leadership and educational skills. Uh, but on top of that, he's a thorough gentleman. He, despite all his activities, he takes time to work in uninsured and underinsured clinics also. It's truly a pleasure for me to uh, invite my colleague and friend, Glenn Hirsch. He's going to talk on my degree education. Thank you. To mention, I invented the internet too. Um, so I chose this topic. I don't normally speak about my regurgitation. Um, last night I was wondering why I chose this topic as I was finishing it off. But part of it is Nancy Middleton Smith um, had acute pulmonary edema of unexplained cause. So I wanted something that could be tied into dyspnea. But this is also a really interesting field. Um, first, I have no disclosures. Thankfully, Drs. Rome and M. Bowley aren't here, so we can skip right past this stuff. That was just for them. The pressure's off. Ask questions whenever you want. Um, it's, a, it's a field that's actually changing now because of the techniques, both in imaging and therapeutics. So after 50 years of doing things the same way, 
we're actually at a point where we're seeing good evidence and maybe even changing our strategies of approach. So just in an overview, we'll go over the background of mitral regurgitation just a little bit, some of the anatomy pathophysiology, which is important to understand, and how we define the severity of mitral regurgitation, how we time surgical therapy, which is the key question in mitral regurgitation for severe mitral regurgitation. In general, I'm referring to severe mitral regurgitation here. And then we'll go over some of the advances in imaging and also the therapeutics. So we have a lot of different ways. You know, we need to have a decent understanding of the anatomy, which I'm going to show you. We have a lot of different modalities. This is echocardiography to evaluate mitral regurgitation. And then our therapeutic approaches are are evolving very quickly at this point. And the question is, should these be moving earlier now in the, in the phase of the disease? So just a couple of quick pretest questions for you to think about. During the talk, by the end, you'll know the answer to these. So at what point would an asymptomatic patient with primary severe mitral regurgitation be, under, uh, be recommended to undergo mitral valve repair? If their EF is less than or equal to 60? Never. If Dr. Stoddard says so, what do you mean by primary mitral regurgitation? So you'll know the answer to that by the end. And then also another one related to uh, this is, what is an annual plasty? It's used in mitral valve repair. It's in replacement. It's something you get before you go on a reality TV show. So this is a case I actually saw in Trinidad. I spent four years, uh, of about a month a year in Trinidad which was a pretty amazing experience. We're seeing a lot of primary presentations of disease. And this was uh, in the fellow's clinic there. Uh, this patient was presented to me. So RG was a 52-year-old man who had a murmur, had an echocardiogram, which takes about six months to get in Trinidad. And it showed that he had severe mitral regurgitation from the posterior leaflet. Uh, he had prolapse. His atria was, was moderately dilated and his ventricle was slightly dilated. His EF was 65. He continues to work on a horse farm. So there's a couple questions that you need to ask this person to try to decide, should we go ahead with surgery? And there's also some other parameters we should be looking at. So by the end of this talk, you'll, you'll be able to answer this question. So review a little bit of the anatomy here. So the mitral valve, when I was a resident, I remember thinking mitral regurgitation, you have it or you don't, it's dichotomous. You know, that's it. That's all that matters. How bad is it? Um, but it turns out, and it's actually much more complex than we'll get into for this talk, but there are two leaflets, um, the anterior leaflet, the posterior leaflet. Not only that, they, these are divided. This is more for echo and surgery of dividing them into the segments or scallops. The anterior leaflet has three and the posterior also has three. The most common valve uh, segment involved in mitral valve prolapse is P2, about 50 to 60 percent of the time. Also, notice the coronary sinus here because we're going to talk about this a little bit later. It, it ends up going around the annulus of the mitral valve. So this is not an exhaustive list of the causes of mitral regurgitation, um, but we'll talk about some of the more common causes and, and the ones that are amenable to repair. So typically, there's mitral valve prolapse with myxomatous degeneration, which is sort of a fibroelastic deficiency, but there's also deposition of glycosaminoglycans. Um, there's uh, degenerative just from aging, which is a similar process. Uh, rheumatic fever can do this, endocarditis, lupus. There's a bunch of others, pseudoxanthoma elastica, Marfan syndrome, trauma. There's, there's a lot of other things, but we're going to mainly spend on the most, our time on the most common causes with mitral valve prolapse, myxomas, degeneration, degeneration with aging. And then there are secondary causes of mitral regurgitation. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about this at the end. But functional MR, really, the valve is intact. It's a manipulation of the subvalvular apparatus or the geometry of the ventricle, which has altered the geometry of the annulus, which allows for regurgitation. So treatment is usually targeted at the underlying illness. So there's ischemic MR, which most people have the misconception that ischemic MR means that you have true ischemia, where you have a lack of blood flow, and that leads to papillary muscle dysfunction and mitral regurgitation. But ischemic MR is really more of a, a complex series of events where you have the infarct, which may or may not involve the papillary muscle, and then left ventricular remodeling, which pulls the annulus apart. And then the dilated cardiomyopathy obviously alters the 
geometry. Even things like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can lead to mitral regurgitation. So well, I'll, I'll, again, I'll talk a little bit about ischemic MR and function, these functional MRs uh, as we move on. So this is just an example of what we're talking about here. The left ventricle is here. This is the parasternal long axis here. Here's the mitral valve. This is a normal mitral valve, the left atrium, aortic valve, and aorta. So just to give you a reference point. This is an apical four-chamber view, just for orientation, right ventricle, tricuspid valve, right atrium, uh, left ventricle, left atrium, which you can see is very large compared to the right atrium. So you're already suspicious something is going on here. And this is a very hyperdynamic ventricle. You would, you're suspicious to see that before you even turn on the color flow, you're thinking, is there going to be mitral regurgitation here? This valve is also thickened. It's not a typical rheumatic heart disease valve, but this patient had had a history of rheumatic fever. And when we look at this, this is one way we look at mitral regurgitation. You can see this flow back into the left atrium, and the color flow takes up a big proportion of the left atrium. Also, the neck here of the jet is, is very large. So this is all suggestive of a significant amount of mitral regurgitation. And there's other ways that we quantify these things. This here is a, an example of functional mitral regurgitation. So here we have a, a cardiomyopathy with a dilated left ventricle. And you can see the papillary muscle, just because the heart dilates, they don't slide down. The geometry is now altered. And what this does is it tethers the leaflets. And you can get a leak, and it's typically central jet of mitral regurgitation. And you may notice this when patients come in in heart failure, they might have more mitral regurgitation as you diurese them on the day of discharge. You may not hear any mitral regurgitation because the annulus diameter here has actually shrunk down and the functional mitral regurgitation has resolved. So this is a, a study that just came out in 2013, but it's actually looking at this ischemic MR. Um, this is a cardiac MRI, delayed enhanced image with gadolinium. And this is the left ventricle. This is a part of the right ventricle here. And what we can see, these are just two slices. The bright spot is infarct. So this is normal myocardium. Here's a papillary muscle. Here's a papillary muscle. This bright scar is an infralateral infarct. Um, and this shows complete papillary muscle infarction of the posterior medial papillary muscle. And you can see it in several different patients here where it's completely infarcted. Here's the other papillary muscle, which is intact. And in this, this case, these cases here, these are partial. So they have sort of seven endocardial infarcts and partial infarction to the papillary muscles. Here's one that's pretty normal except for a small anterior infarct and involvement of the papillary muscle, although there's still some viable tissue in there. And what's important about this? Well, we, we notice in patients uh, who have complete or, or partial uh, infarction, they have more moderate and severe mitral regurgitation. And it looked like if you had lateral wall involvement, typically the circumflex, that those patients had more moderate to severe or severe uh, mitral regurgitation. And in patients who had a complete papillary muscle infarction had a higher rate of regurgitation. This makes sense. So this is actual true papillary muscle dysfunction, but then eventually the heart starts to remodel and dilate. So you have this cascade of dilation that leads to more functional mitral regurgitation. This makes this a, a difficult disease to treat. So again, the, the most common area for the infarcts to cause this was left circumflex territory and the lateral uh, side of the heart here. So this is just an example of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here's an environment, and this is a transesophageal echo, so the anatomy is different here. We have left atrium, mitral valve, left ventricle. This is a thick septum. What happens here is there's a lot of turbulence through the LV outflow tract because of this thick septum, it's narrowed. And this leads to a venturi effect. It's something called systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. And you can see that the cordae and the leaflet actually get pulled in, and it leads to regurgitation during systole there. And in fact, the, the, depending on the anatomy, the mitral valve may even develop a plaque uh, on the underneath side, and that can lead to and, you know, a susceptibility to endocarditis. So they used to be even recommended to give endocarditis prophylaxis, which is now gone. That indication isn't there, but that's the mechanism for that, that how that person will get endocarditis. And these people, we're not going to talk about it after this slide, get better if you do a myomectomy or septal ablation, the mitral regurgitation. So we're going to spend most of the time talking about degenerative mitral bowel disease and 
how do we define prolapse? So prolapse is, here's the annulus, you gotta be at least two millimeters behind the annulus, and this is the posterior leaflet, this is the anterior leaflet, which is longer. So this is posterior leaflet prolapse, which is very common uh, form of foot prolapse. This is bi-leaflet, anterior and posterior leaflet prolapse. And this is a transesophageal echo, showing what typically happens. So you could have prolapse, leading to regurgitation. Eventually, because of this fibroelastic deficiency, you also can rupture chordae. So they either elongate or they rupture, and you can get a flail leaflet. So this is a partial flail of the posterior leaflet, and you get this very eccentric jet of mitral regurgitation. And when it's from the posterior leaflet, it actually the jet goes anterior. So you'll hear it at the left sternal border instead of at the apex. So pathophysiologically, what's happening? Well, it's really just a volume overload. You get this eccentric hypertrophy and LV dilation, which in the short run, which can last up to several years, you have uh, maintenance of the stroke volume and cardiac output. But over time, eventually you're going to lose contract, uh, contractility and develop systolic dysfunction. And there'll be a loss of stroke volume, cardiac output, elevation in pulmonary pressures, pulmonary edema, dyspnea, and of course, atrial fibrillation, because the left atrium dilates. It's a very low compliance chamber, so it dilates, which originally compensates, so you don't get pulmonary edema, but it leads to a susceptibility to atrial fibrillation. There's also significant amount, a significant amount of sympathetic activation of mitral regurgitation, and catecholamines are elevated in severe mitral regurgitation in humans and in dog models. And in dog models, they use beta blockers, and it shows that the contractility actually improves. And that, that happens in regular heart failure as well. But in mitral regurgitation in the canine model, contractility improves with beta blockers. So what, what do we do to assess this? Obviously, you saw them in clinic, you were worried about shortness of breath, murmur, uh, or you just heard the murmur, and you decide to get a, a transthoracic echocardiogram. Um, typically, we do this if someone has severe mitral regurgitation on an annual basis. Depending on the patient, it may be as, as frequently as six months. Um, and we reevaluate every time status changes. If there's any questions, sometimes people pop cordae, and now their, their severe MR has worsened dramatically in a short amount of time. Um, a TEE is not necessary up front unless there's poor image quality or there's some uh, lack of clarity about the mechanism of the mitral regurgitation and also judging repairability of the valve because as you'll see, repairability versus replacement is a key point. <coughs> so I will not go over every parameter that we use with ECHO to judge the severity of MR, but just to tell you that we look at the size of the chambers. If there's a lot of color for the Doppler, and the chambers are all normal, and there's no reason this person had an acute papillary muscle rupture, it's probably not severe MR. Uh, because you, over time, these things, that's the, the compensation is to dilate. So we're looking at dilated LA, LV, and then look at the valve. If the valve looks totally normal. So sometimes we'll see that in uh, functional mitral regurgitation, the valve looks totally normal. There's a lot of regurgitation. The treatment isn't treating that valve necessarily, it's treating the uh, underlying disease. There's a bunch of Doppler parameters that we look at. And then other quantitative parameters which have been validated, the vena contract is sort of the neck of the Doppler jet, regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, and then what's the actual area of the regurgitant orifice. So we use several different modalities, echo being the most common, to quantify these things. So this is just an example of what we're looking at on echo. Again, a four-chamber apical view, left ventricle, mitral valve, the jet of mitral regurgitation, a narrow vena contractor, that neck. Here's a large left atrium, and then here's the, the Doppler. Um, here is another example of moderate mitral regurgitation. You see it's going further back now. The neck may be widening. Here's severe mitral regurgitation with a thicker vena contractor, and also filling a lot of the atrium. And the Doppler starts to change in the intensity of the mitral regurgitation. Also, you can see that there's a lot of early filling, and that's not part of the test here. This is something we do, but there are, there are several different things because one assessment alone isn't enough to say, oh, sure, that's severe enough. We take them as a, as a whole. So there's some emerging techniques, even with echocardiography. Um, this is a TEE, and there's a, a flail anterior leaflet where you can actually see the chordae coming up into the left atrium. And if we look with 3D transesophageal echo, you can see you, you, the resolution in real time. You can even see the chordae flailing. Here's another example of it. This is the A3 segment of the anterior leaflet. And that correlates very well with what's seen in the operating 
this paper actually just recently came out. We're not doing this clinically, but just to show you that the, the mitral valve is a, is a complicated structure um, and the, the approaches to it continue to evolve so uh, very, quick, very quickly at this time. This is using the new modality of 3D transesophageal echo and doing a, a computational simulation of strain of the uh, mitral valve leaflets themselves. Here's the 3D TE, so this is in systole when the valve is closed, and you can see there's no regurgitant orifice here, this is a normal valve, and here it is in diastole open, this is the aortic valve. This is sort of the, uh, a surgical view uh, of what the surgeon sees when they go in. And then these are the leaflets. And so here's another example, normal valve, diastole, systole, it's closed, anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet. And actually, it looks pretty normal. And this is a wall of stress that's felt by the leaflet. And you can see there's a little bit of stress, but overall, it's pretty green. It's happy. Here's somebody who has a, a ruptured T2 segment. So we have posterior leaflet, anterior leaflet open. And then here we are in systole. You can even see the little cordia of this T2 segment sticking out. There's mitral regurgitation here. And with the computational simulation, we see, you can see that leaflet. We can also see this asymmetric stress on the, annu on the annulus and also the leaflet, and this may lead to progressive deterioration. And here's an example of functional microregurgitation with a regurgitant orifice and systole, giving you a jet, and you can see there's more, a little more diffuse but still patchy stress all over the valve, even though the problem is really with the ventricle. So this video, for the rest of you, don't use MPEG-4 video files for these presentations because it'll just look like that. Um, you can also use MRI. You can use CT too, but CT obviously you're getting a lot of radiation to do something you can do with uh, echocardiography or even MRI. This is a, an MRI with the left ventricle here, the mitral valve here, left atrium, and you can see the jets here. You can see a jet of mitral regurgitation here. This is a, these are steady state pre-procession images. Um, this here is a uh, a velocity encoded image, so you can actually look at the velocity and you can see the flow of mitral regurgitation here and you can quantify a vena contractor or the neck. You can actually see the jets here. Similarly, you can take a plane. The thing about MRI or CT is you can just take a plane wherever you want, wherever the region of interest is. So if it's here where there's mitral regurgitation going up into the left atrium, you can take a slice through here and see it in a short axis view and you can even calculate a regurgitant orifice area by tracing it. This is an example, this is interesting, this is mitral valve prolapse, and as most of you know, as the ventricle contracts, the mitral valve starts to prolapse into, into the left atrium, but usually that's gonna be mid-systole or later, and that's why people have a mid-systole click, and even mitral regurg may only be from halfway through systole to the end. This is an imaging example of that. So here's mitral valve prolapse with some regurgitation in early systole. This is just the leaflet coapting. In late systole, you can see there's some leaks here. So this is a typical classic case of mitral valve prolapse with a mid stop click and leak in late systole. So what about determining who needs surgery? Um, we know if someone has severe mitral regurgitation, they're gonna end up with surgery most likely, especially if it's a degenerative process and they're a candidate. Uh, from a functional status and lifespan expectancy. But what other ways can we help determine who needs surgery? So what about exercise testing? This is a very small study that showed if you could really exercise, this is a high functional status that you would do very well even out to years. This is with severe mitral regurgitation. And this is looking at the, their event rate for sudden cardiac death, AFib, drop in your EF, or battery in your heart. But if you had a poor functional status, and under 15 minutes isn't actually that poor. Uh, then you would have problems, one of these things, or surgery before uh, about eight years. So that functional status is important, and it can be really useful, especially in people where maybe they're not a great historian or you're not sure, and you can get them on the treadmill, and if they can't exercise, it may be their valve. So one of the things that's really unique about valvular heart disease, and especially mitral regurgitation, is people don't say, I can't breathe, I'm swelling up, I have chest pain, sometimes with aortic stenosis, for example, but with mitral regurgitation, often they just feel tired. And it's such an insidious onset that un they, people don't even recognize it. They just start changing their lifestyle. Um, so this can be helpful in those cases because what we do is you can assess their functional status, but if you do an echo at baseline, you can see this 
regurgitant orifice here, and you can see this jet of mitral regurgitation, which is eccentric. Um, and we can, this is just calculating, we use these techniques to calculate regurgitant volumes. This one is not severe, this is sort of a moderate, moderate severe mitral regurgitation. This is their pulmonary pressure, which is around moderate pulmonary hypertension, this is in the 50s most likely. And then if, we, if you exercise the person and you see, look at all the mitral regurgitation, we have severe MR and now we have pulmonary pressures in the 80s. This is consistent with severe pulmonary hypertension. This could explain the symptoms. So sometimes even someone who has moderate mitral regurg, their symptoms are out of proportion, or you have someone with severe mitral regurgitation and you want to assess their functional status, exercise testing can be useful. One thing I should tell you is that the data for these studies, the most robust is in rheumatic heart disease, not degenerative. And that's an issue and why we have disclosure slide number two. Because our ACC AHA guidelines, which are great and in-depth, where the summary is still 60 pages long, uh, if you don't read the full guidelines, when you look at the actual level of evidence, it's not very high. We don't have a lot of trials in valvular heart disease. <clears throat> Originally, people saw the natural history curves of what happens if you don't operate on severe valvular disease, and no one wants to wait or get and randomized into a trial. Recently, we have had more data, especially with TAVI, uh, replacement, percutaneous replacements of aortic valves. But all of this is our recent developments in valvular heart disease in the whole field. We have a lot of expert opinion, which is probably good, but that's most of it. In fact, let me just summarize how our guidelines work. The, uh, the, we, we summarize the level of evidence, whether if you have multiple randomized trials or a single one, or hey, you know, level C is, we think it's a good idea because we know what we're doing, or there's a couple of cases. And then we classify the recommendation. Yet class one is there's, everyone agrees on this. Class two there's, is divided into A and B. A is, yeah, we probably should do this. B is, maybe we should do this. Three is, don't do this. It may even be harmful. So if we just take this exercise testing and valvular heart disease example, you know, we, it's a class two A. So most people say, yeah, it's probably good. The level of evidence, it's expert opinion. And in fact, if we look at our valvular disease guidelines from the ACC and American Heart Association from 2006, there are 320 recommendations. One has a level of evidence of A. And it's a mitral commissurotomy for severe mitral stenosis with symptoms. Most of these are expert opinion. And there is some evidence, though, that suggests that following the expert opinion still leads to better outcomes. So, Again, trying to assess who should we be sending to surgery? Are there any other things we can look at, such as biomarkers? There's a few studies with uh, brain natriuretic peptide. This one's in 269 patients. They're asymptomatic with severe MR. Using receiver operator curve to find a cutoff, they used a BNP of 105 and showed that you, would, you were more likely to have CHF, LV systolic dysfunction, or death before surgery if your BNP was greater than 105. Another one looked at patients who were about to go through surgery and how people did post-operatively based on their BNP. So part of the idea is, when I, when I say the timing is tricky, is if you do develop symptoms, you don't do as well post-operatively, even after the valve's repaired or replaced. So there's a, a finite moment, uh, a golden moment, so to speak, of when to send people to surgery, which is why we need better and better tools to decide on timing. This one's looking at a composite endpoint of death or a cardiac hospitalization after surgery. So if you came in with an elevated BNP, you didn't do as well. Even if you didn't have symptoms, it still didn't do quite as well as people who had a lower BNP. In the future, well, if, if sympathetic activity goes along with more mitral regurgitation, maybe measuring catecholamines or even looking at heart rate variability may help predict uh, who needs to go to the OR. Um, there, the heart is enlarging and remodeling, and a lot of that is uh, matrix metalloproteinases, especially 2, 3, and 9 are activated. We know in acute coronary syndromes, for example, you can measure elevated levels of uh, 2 and 9 in the serum, and maybe we can do that for valvular heart disease to say, you know what, even though there's not frank LV systolic dysfunction, we know the heart is remodeling at a level that we need to stop it because it may not recover. We also eventually have apoptosis and loss of contractile elements, maybe the ultra-sensitive troponins, which lead to 900% more consults in the hospital could be used to uh, judge the onset of LV systolic dysfunction and timing of surgery. 
So what about medical therapy? You know, we talk about aortic regurgitation having some medical therapy. What about in mitral regurgitation? So we already know there's sympathetic activation. What about the effect of beta blockers? So this is a retrospective study, and it looked at a fair number of patients here for a valve and heart disease study. Regardless of if you had hypertension or coronary disease, there was a better survival for patients with severe mitral regurgitation who were taking beta blockers. And that was irrespective of if they had surgery or no surgery. Obviously, people who had surgery did better than not with the severe mitral regurgitation. This didn't matter if they had coronary disease or no coronary disease. This trial was in the last year. Um, it's a phase 2B, so it's only 38 patients. And it lasted for two years. And they used long-acting beta blocker, beta-1 selective agent, in patients with severe mitral regurgitation. And they showed over the two years that the beta blocker just maintained the ejection fraction. But those patients not on a beta blocker, the ejection fraction dropped 5%. And actually dropping or getting to 60% is an indication for surgery. Uh, in, the, in this trial, even though there's only 38 patients, six people in the placebo arm ended up in surgery within two years versus two in the beta blocker uh, arm. It's important to remember, as we saw in one of the earlier images, the EF is really high in mitral regurgitation originally, because not only is it ejecting out the aorta, but it's going right out the mitral valve into the left atrium. So the EF can be 75%. So when you're down to 60, 55, that's actually really poor for mitral regurgitation. It shows significant LV systolic dysfunction. So what about the future? Well, we need a large trial. Um, Again, this is one of those things that there's not really a lot going on there, um, but we need more data. Uh, when do we intervene? I hope you're getting the point. That's that's the key question because because of our emerging techniques, we we're starting to think maybe we should you know the mortality is so low and the success is so high, maybe we should be intervening even on asymptomatic patients. So the current guidelines, the ACC AHA from the U.S. obviously. These are from 2006. The next one, uh, the next ones are being generated now. The ESC or European Society of Cardiology has put out guidelines in 2012, and six years later, they haven't changed a lot. They basically say, if you're symptomatic, yes, everybody should go. If you're asymptomatic, if your EF is dropping, you should go. <clears throat> if you're getting pulmonary hypertension at rest or with exercise, you know everybody thinks, yeah, it's probably a good idea. You know, why wait any longer? Um, Europeans aren't as sure about the exercise data. AFib, yes, you're going to have a lifetime of morbidity. Um, and then if now people are thinking with normal LV function and the repair is feasible, that maybe it's a good idea to start thinking, maybe I should send this patient earlier to surgery, but timing it is, is key. We, we want to avoid irreversible dysfunction, atrial and ventricular, pulmonary hypertension, or, or even death while waiting for surgery. So should people with severe degenerative mitral regurgitation be referred? Um, we don't know. There is a study of watchful waiting, uh, and I'll, I'll give you some information about that. So why, why would we even consider sending someone to cardiac surgery who's feeling fine? Uh, obviously, if they could get a mitral valve repair, they do very well. So if you have no symptoms, even at 15 years, 96% of people don't even have moderate MR or significant moderate to severe MR 15 years later. The problem is, uh, and, and if you had symptoms, you didn't do as well. But the problem is, if you end up with a mitral valve replacement because you're in a center that doesn't do a lot of repairs or isn't as skilled and bails out and gives you a replacement, you're not going to do as well. You're going to have morbidity from anticoagulation. Also, the ventricle models differently. Uh, you also may or may not be on anticoagulation. Plus, if you're not, you may need a new valve in 10 to 15 years. So. In the United States, if we look at the uh, thoracic surgery database, you can see that the, this is the percent of all the mitral valves uh, repaired. You can see it's, it's steadily increasing, but for some reason, it's plateaued around 70%. I don't know why that is. If, uh, not everyone's trained in these repairs. The mitral valve is actually a complex structure, and so it's more of the young trainees and advanced centers that are coming out and, and spreading it around. Um, another thing is we don't know it's great to get a repair. We know you do better than a replacement, but we don't know data on how uh, how much uh, regurgitation is present. You know, they, they give us what they did, but not what happened. And that has prognostic significance. And obviously, we're doing a lot more repairs, so it'd be great to have this kind of data. So there are four studies that look at death in early mitral valve repair. 
the death rate um, waiting for surgery is zero to eight percent a year. This one, though, was in a series that this was right before the guidelines were released. In fact, the people who reported this released the guidelines. Uh, so when people started following the guidelines, even though it's a lot of it based on um, expert opinion and consensus, the, the rate was more uh, was about zero. And there were two people who died, but these were people who were recommended to go through surgery and declined. So the guidelines, despite the fact there's not a lot of evidence, at least we have some inkling that they're, they're not a bad set of guidelines. Uh, what's the natural history of the disease? Well, in about five years, 35 to 40 percent of people will have already uh, needed surgery. Um, one series had it as high as 64 percent within five years. This one did much more rigorous, stringent evaluation of the severity of mitral regurgitation. So these were definite severe mitral regurgitations. Because sometimes uh, it depends on the skill of the echocardiography lab. Uh, they may or may not be correct. What are the, this is a, a helpful slide to, to get an idea of why, why are we thinking again that we should send an asymptomatic patient to surgery? Well, if you come in with symptoms and you get a repair, you do not do as well as somebody, this is 10 years out, you can see there's a pretty substantial difference if you came in with very little to few symptoms to advanced symptoms. And if you look at their functional class, you can actually get someone back to the expected survival for their age group if you repair them early. And if you come in late, you're not going to be the same. And this is uh, the difference between valve replacement and valve repair. You can see that having less symptoms is better, regardless of if it's a replacement or a repair. But you can also see that the people who got repaired did better than people who got replaced. I mean, at 10 years, 40% survival versus 55. So, there's a, there's a link, like most procedures, between hospital volume and outcomes. So if we look, hospital mortality decreases. We're talking of mortality of 0.48. I mean, appendectomies are less than 1%. The mitral valve repair is down that far now in the right patients. And you can see that it's tied to volume, that the higher the volume, the higher percent that are repaired. Jewish Hospital, I talked to Mark Slaughter about this in the last week. He said they do about 200 cases a year, about 100 are primary mitral valve repairs now, or, or replacements. 90% are repaired. Uh, another 100 are tied on. Maybe someone's having a bypass and they have ischemic mitral regurgitation that complex and they'll put an annuloplasty ring on those patients. These flow charts, usually when someone puts this up, I'm going, my eyes go, go down. But uh, the bottom line is if you have symptoms, you're probably going to get surgery. If not, it's a tough question to see cardiology uh, because we're, it's a conversation with the patient and also trying medical therapy. Because once your EF is very low, it's less than 30%, you don't do well. You definitely don't do well with a replacement. Some people think that repairing those valves may be useful. If your EF is dropping, even if you're asymptomatic, you should think about surgery. If you're getting new AFib, pulmonary hypertension, consider surgery. I remember we're here to help. So what does a mitral valve repair entail? Um, they, this, is, this is a really great advance in all of cardiovascular medicine and surgery. This, here's again the a review in uh, the anterior leaflet with the posterior leaflet here and the segments. P2 is the most common segment involved in prolapse. And what they do is they actually excise this because there's normally excessive leaflet and they can uh, bring it together, suture it, and put on an annuloplasty ring. Here it is by TEE, that's that prolapsing P2 with the chordate here. And you can see an annual plasty ring and the, the valve with the suture here. And people normally get excellent results. Now, cardiology has been moving into the cardiac surgery realm, so they have to start thinking, we got to do something to make this less morbid of a procedure. And it turns out mitral valve repair is a great surgery that's amenable to a minimally invasive approach versus a sternotomy. Now, we joke that this is the same, you know, asking a patient, do you want to get hit by a bus or a pickup truck? You know, it still hurts, but the recovery is a lot faster in a lateral thoracotomy. So it turns out because of the way the heart lies in the chest, that when you open from the lateral chest and go through the atrium, the mitral valve is sitting right there. So it's, it's really amenable to uh, a minimally invasive approach as well. This was from Dr. Slaughter, he gave me this yesterday. This was, uh, 
apparently the surgeons wear head cams and they broadcast this at the Louisville Museum, maybe the Science Museum, and there's kids there who can ask questions. Uh, I was thinking if I was wearing a head cam, you'd see a monitor or rounds or echoes all day. It's not quite as exciting as this, but here you see um, the, they're putting in sutures where they're going to put an annular plastic ring. Uh, that's the annular plastic ring, and then they're, they they finish the surgery here, and they, they're going to test the competence of the valve. So they inject. They have to refill the heart after they took all the blood out. Okay. And this is the posterior leaflet. They inject. I know the uh, root band, but And they're going to do it again. And what happens is there's no leak. And at the end of the surgery here, you'll hear a little excitement like head on the back, but that, that's what it looks like. Uh, they love doing those surgeries. All of the surgeons do it. Um, so Dr. Flaherty's here in the front, and his job is to try to take away as much business as possible. Let's see how his group is doing. So are there any percutaneous strategies for mitral valve? Well, this one, a few years ago, people started thinking, I told you in the beginning, remember the coronary sinus runs along the annulus of the mitral valve? Here's the posterior and anterior leaflet. What if we could go in through the coronary sinus percutaneously and put in an annuloplasty ring? This is what the device looked like. You go around here and you cinch it tighter. And you can have a fancy ad for it. The problem was the micro valve is more of a saddle. It's not straight. Um, the other problem is and why we don't do this anymore, is the coronary sinus is sort of unpredictable. It's supposed to run in the atrioventricular groove. This is a CT scan where you have the left atrium, left ventricle. The sinus may be above the groove. This is where the mitral valve is sitting. It may be in the right spot. It might be below the groove. It could be anywhere. And not only that, the left circumflex runs underneath or a branch can. So sometimes people would cinch the annuloplasty down and simultaneously occlude the left circumflex, which is not an <coughs> optimal outcome or something. Um, so let me just highlight another type of repair. Now, there, I, I told you microvalve repair is advancing very quickly, and there's a bunch of different types of repairs that, are, that can occur. These are very sophisticated. Um, this Alfieri repair, where it's called an edge-to-edge -edge stitch with an, uh, an annual plasty ring, this was uh, Ottavio Alfieri, an Italian surgeon. In 1994, he started doing this. Um, here's what it looks like, an edge-to-edge -edge repair. And the reason I'm pointing this one out, if this is all you are doing to try to reduce the amount of um, mitral regurgitation, maybe there's a percutaneous way to do this. So there's something called the mitral clip. Uh, you come in percutaneously, place the clip in the center of the leaflets, and get this edge-to-edge -edge repair, which looks like this. And actually, there was a trial looking at this, and it was uh, the Evers trial. And they showed a reduction in mitral regurgitation. Now, this, this isn't for everybody. If you have a repairable mitral valve prolapse, you don't want this. This is not a great outcome. If you have functional mitral regurgitation, it may be helpful. But that's what we're, why we're having more trials. So there was an you know, I told you, now we're finally getting data in valvular heart disease. This Evers 2 trial looked at this mitral clip in severe moderate, severe, severe mitral regurgitation versus surgery. Um, this is a 3D TEE where you can see the placement of the mitral clip and getting this edge-to-edge -edge repair. And here's an example by Doppler on TEE. The clip is here, and you can see there's very little regurgitation after the clip is placed. Actually, Liz Taylor had this done before she passed away. Um, People ended up going back for more surgery if for an actual repair or replacement if the mitral clip didn't work more often in the group. But the morbidity and mortality was lower, not surprisingly, getting a clip versus cardiac surgery. And these are people, again, that were functional MR. So usually there's something else going on. It's not just a valve problem. There's a ventricular problem as well. So, it's hard to go through a, a talk about valvular heart disease and cardiology today without talking about transcatheter, aortic valve implantation, or replacement. And this is done by placing a, a wire through into the left ventricle and a balloon with a valve on it in the aortic position, which was first done in France. And when people started doing it, everyone took a collective sign and said, oh, are you crazy? But it seems to be working, especially in the high-risk patients. There's a lot of data on this now. And you can see they're injecting the aorta here, and you can see there's no leak in its tape. This is the, the size of the stent where the valve is, is in the middle of this. 
So what about that for mitral regurgitation? Well, here's an example by left ventriculography. We have a catheter in the left ventricle, and you're injecting dye. You can see this is the left atrium, which is humongous, and that's from ongoing mitral regurgitation. Um, you can see that, uh, well, it's wide open in, in the left atrium style. So that's severe mitral regurgitation by ventriculography. This is a sheet model, but this is in a, uh, they put an annuloplasty ring in first, and then they came by and said, well, can we do a valve and valve, so to speak, the valve and ring mitral valve replacement? And it looked like if someone already has a ring in place, that you can actually get a great deployment of the valve in the mitral valve position percutaneously. And you can see there's no mitral regurgitation compared to here to here. Again, this is a sheet model. But this may be feasible. A lot of people who have ischemic mitral regurgitation, what happens is they get a bypass, and they'll get an annuloplasty ring just to tighten up the annulus so it's not as functionally regurgitant. So if that fails, which usually happens as there's progressive LV remodeling, you may be able to go in percutaneously, because this is a nice landing ground for these mitral valves. This, this is similar in uh, aortic valves. People have done what are called valve and valve. If someone has a bioprosthetic valve, they can go in. It has to be large enough that you can now do a TAVI right inside of the bioprosthetic valve. Obviously, you're running out of space. It's like putting replacement windows in the house instead of new windows. If you keep going, you'll have a little circle, but uh, it's feasible. And this is just to show you that this is a sheet model. Again, there's great coaptation. Actually, the stroke rates um, in humans, this has been done in a registry. This is in Europe. I'm sure you, most of you were at the London Valves conference in 2012. Um, they looked at, these are 91 very high risk patients where they decided let's try to do the valve in the ring or valve and valve uh, uh, replacements for mitral valve. Again, these are really sick people because no one would operate on them. So the mortality was very high. 75% uh, are alive at one year. But those who survived, most of them were class one or two New York Heart Association. So 10 out of 91 died with the procedure. Uh, so, but this is the largest series to date, 91 patients. So it's, this is happening now. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating how in the last five to 10 years, how much valvular heart disease therapies have changed. Of course, you know, we're all trying to move towards this percutaneous approach. Do you want this or this? This was a slide from an interventionalist, of course. This is cheating a little bit because to do the valves, it's a much larger sheet than this, but it gets the point across. It's still better than that. So what's next? This is a, an example of an ear that was grown under the skin. This is rib cartilage to replace a cancer patient's ears. But maybe can we use stem cells to grow new valves, grow your own new valve? There's actually a, a paper about this, tissue engineered valves. And in young people and in pediatric populations, this is really important because when you replace the valve, reoperations are very dangerous, they're very difficult, and the patients are going to be growing and they're going to outgrow this. And also the need for anticoagulation. If we could grow valves that would grow with the patient, repair, remodel, that could be a more permanent solution. So there's even a paper that came out two years ago talking about where are we, what needs to be done in terms of building the appropriate bioscaffolding and tissue cell engineering to get to that stage. So people are thinking about it. So let's go back to the patient I saw in Trinidad um, in the fellows clinic. So he's 52, he comes in, he had a murmur, he had severe mitral valve prolapse and regurgitation of the posterior leaf, but it looks like it's a repairable problem. The fellow says he has no symptoms, he works on a horse farm. Okay, let's go see the patient. You know, so what do you do at the farm? Well, I work in the bar. Oh, really? Well, what were you doing six months ago or a year ago? I used to work out with the horses running around, but I, you know, I, I've been tired lately, so I just, they gave me a job in the bar. Oh, really? What's, what do you mean you're tired? I'm just getting older. How old are you? 53. Oh, so you were 52 and a half six months ago. Now you're 53 and you're getting older. That's typical, that's a classic story of what happens with valvular heart disease and what you need to ask. And that's one way to help people quantify to say, what were you doing six months ago? What were you doing a year ago? And if it's changed dramatically, that suggests that they have symptoms. And so if you're not sure, again, you can put them on a treadmill, you can do exercise echo. In Trinidad, the wait for surgery is very long. So at that point, even if he wasn't symptomatic, we might have said, get in line. Uh, but we referred him for surgery. So just to summarize, 
There's a lot of different etiologies of mitral regurgitation. The degenerative type, mitral valve prolapse, and with aging is most common, it's repairable. We don't want to wait too long, and we need to time it right. But careful monitoring or watchful waiting can be effective and safe. Um, in people who have a very high likelihood of repair, um, it's worth talking to them and offering the option. Some people might say, you know, my father had AFib and what a pain in the butt and he had bleeding and you know all these other things, so I want to get this taken care of. Uh, we need more evidence and it's coming. There's a lot of new improvements in therapies for mitral regurgitation, but also all about the heart disease. So thank you. Thanks for Nancy Middleton's family. And, uh, thanks to Jason back there who waited until Friday to get the title of my talk and Monday for the bio. <laughs> You, you're very patient. I'm happy to take any questions. How often is the exomatous degeneration from the LDL plant? What's known about the pathogens? That's a good question. So there are some genetic forms of mitral valve prolapse, like Barlow's disease. Um, I don't know the actual number of how often it's familial, but it, it it's because it's sort of a, a mixed bag, there are a lot of diseases. For example, the Marfan syndrome is autosomal dominant. Most of those people not only have mitral valve prolapse, they can have tricuspid valve prolapse, pulmonary aortic valve prolapse, so, and that's very common. That they, in fact, that's when you're trying to say, does this person have Marfan's? Before you do genetic testings, you're looking at their aortic root, and do they have mitral valve prolapse, pseudosanthoma, elasticum, Ehlers-Danlos, all of those are associated, all those connective tissue diseases with that sort of thing. So some people also have the isolated version of it. And the, the degeneration, the difference between the typical mitral valve syndrome and the degenerative one, you'll see thickening. The leaflets are about five millimeters or thicker. They're elongated. And those people have the, the syndrome. But there is certainly a genetic link with the majority of those. And it, it's, it's called a fibroelastic deficiency. And, degeneration over time, but it's not clear exactly why. I mean, in patients with Marfan, for example, elastin defragments, it's somewhere along those lines, but it's not completely understood. Because it'd be great if we could halt it with a therapy. You had another question? OK. OK. Yeah, so the question is about, is there anything from the internist or primary care side that people could be doing to try to slow the progression? Um, so the only thing we know about is beta blockers. Um, that, that probably is helpful. We know in the functional mitral regurgitation that treating the underlying disease aggressively helps the mitral regurgitation. For example, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, aldosterone antagonists, even by pacing the mitral regurgitation goes down. Um, so being aggressive for secondary, of course, for primary, probably beta blockers. Now people might say, well, what about ACE inhibitors? If you decrease afterload, for example, when, on physical exam, when we're trying to bring out mitral regurgitation, you have someone do a hand grip. And that isometric exercise raises afterload, raises the blood pressure. So why don't we lower afterload? The problem is, unlike aortic regurgitation, which does benefit from afterload reduction, um, the afterload's already really, really low. Because you're not you're going out the aorta, but you're also going whatever's not going out the aorta is going out into the left atrium, so it's already unloaded. And then depending on the mechanism, if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for example, lowering the afterload will shrink the so the LVOT gradient, that obstruction, is even greater, and you'll cause more mitral regurgitation. So I would say blocker is probably helpful in, in all cases, but that's based on a couple of studies, animal models, a 38 patient phase 2B trial, but it makes sense. Um, and we see this in other heart failure trials where you can prevent apoptosis because what eventually happens is you are developing a cardiomyopathy. What starts as a valvular disease becomes a myocardial disease that can be irreversible. So protecting it with beta blockers does seem there's reasonable evidence that that could be protected. Can you say something about the, the valvular disease associated with diet? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is about uh, valvular disease associated with diet medications. Um, that obviously was a big problem with FenFen. -fen. 
you know, if you looked at the, the color flow Doppler on there, I remember when these cases were going on, there were attorneys who were hiring fellows to read all these echoes of people. And they would turn the gain up, and it would look like there's all this regurgitation. So thankfully, we have these quantitative techniques. So now if you want to prove that something is drug-related, you have to have really uh, well-quantified uh, severity of mitral recurge. Um, they definitely caused it, just like um, it's a similar mechanism to even what carcinoid, why there's deposition on the valve and degradation. It can cause pulmonary hypertension. It doesn't seem to be as prevalent these days, although there is some link with the Parkinsonian drug, <coughs> probably through dopaminergic effects. Um, we don't see a lot of it, but it's well described. The, I didn't get into it, but there's a lot of other things, even radiation that are causing galvulitis. Uh, there, there are a lot of other different things, but medication-wise, right now the things that we still use would be the Parkinsonian drugs that may cause some of their dysfunction. Dr. Flaherty. What do you do with your patient if you're asymptomatic? Patient who has severe mental regurgitation that has an EF of 4% and they have no left particular modeling to suggest that they're, that they're decompensating. You don't know if they're on their way up or they're on their way down. So maybe, they, maybe in a year it's going to be 65% because they're decompensating. Or maybe in a year it's going to be. Yeah, so the question is, what do you do with the people on the borderline? I think, I mean, the guidelines say under 60 or even at 60, it's time to go, even without symptoms. But yeah, you don't know, for example, let's say someone started off at 70 and now they're 65. <laughs> it makes me worried. Of course, there's inter-reader variability on echoes, for example, about 5%. So you may want to reassess that person earlier. You know, you may want to put them on the treadmill and check their functional status. Um, but normally we follow these people every year with an echo or change in symptoms. But if you're not sure, even within six months, to reassess it is, is useful. Because, I mean, I have seen uh, more than one case where someone sat on the patients for a long time or they get lost to follow up and they come back with a cardiomyopathy. And now it's like, well, eventually a transplant you know, is your answer, where you could have had a repair uh, in the long run. Glenn, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. And uh, just have one last minute. <clears throat> we have a, this is one of our key lectures every year, and uh, uh, like a flag. So it says uh, Department of Medicine, 17th Annual Nancy Middleton Smith Lecture, presented uh, January, February 28, 2013, by Glenn Hirsch. So, Thank you.